Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to a very special episode of Chile Talk. I am your host, Hella Chile. Today, we have an amazing guest. But before I introduce her, I'm going to roll the intro. So today's guest needs no introduction. She's one of the most influential women in Cambodia's music scene, focusing on original music and has a roster of the hottest stars in the motherland. She's a super talented musician. She's also the CEO of Barame Production. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Miss Laura Mam. Hello. What How up, are what you? Up? Thank you so <laughs> much for taking your time and you know, in your busy schedule to chat with me. Ah, thank you for having me. I'm, we're also like locked down on COVID here. So this is a perfect time to talk. Wow. It's a little sad, but we'll get there. I believe too soon. We'll make yeah, it. I pray, <laughs> pray everything gets better with the whole COVID situation. And so come on. Um, first off, I want to say I'm a big fan of you for the longest time. And we've been like longtime friends on Facebook and social media. And I'm really happy yeah. to see you grow over the years and just leading the way, setting the gold standard for, you know, Cambodia's original music scene. Thank you, dude. I'm a big fan of you too. I mean, we've been since, it's been a long time, you and me. So Mm -hmm. since that last stage in LA, so that was really, really fun. Yes, ma'am. That was good times. So let's get right to it, Laura. Tell me about your your background, like what you grew up and stuff. So I'm pretty sure like the the viewers and audience would like to know more about you on on that story. Okay. Um, so I grew up in the Bay. I grew up in San Jose. San Jose, you know, it is what it is. Um, but yeah, I grew up, I, I was born in, in, um, El Camino Hospital. I was born in basically Santa Clara County and in California. And yeah, I grew up there. I was big into the Bay culture and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I was like living in my little Cambodian home at home, but outside, life was very hip hop. So <laughs> that's basically <laughs> kind of how I grew up and stuff. So yeah, that's, that's where I'm from and stuff. Yeah. I got so much love for the Bay, you know, I got, I got to credit Hella from the Bay. Cause like yeah. everything that the, you know, the Bay influences the Pacific Northwest. We're pretty much like, I feel like we're like the, the small cousin to the Bay. Like every, everything like E40, two shorts doing, we're bumping, you know? <laughs> so it's like, I oh. always have to mention that. Oh. I think it's all kind of like one region sometimes, especially the Asians. Right, exactly. <laughs> we're, all, like, we're all in it together, but you know, West Coast, you know, I love it. <laughs> so, so you said you uh, you were born in San Jose. Is that where you grew up? And um, you have like siblings and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I grew up in San Jose. Um, I have a brother and sister. Um, my brother also a big Bay head. Um, Andrew, Andy, Dash Game. He's out here with me now. Um, he's my creative director at Barmay as well. And then I have a little sister named Tiffany, and she's like super good at guitar. Um, but I also grew up around like all girl cousins. I had a big extended family, so like 13 girl cousins and stuff like that. And like when I grew up around here and in, in, in the Bay, actually, not here because I'm in Cambodia now, but in the Bay, I grew up, like, I'm the youngest girl cousin, so I grew up around, like, all Cambodian girls that was, they were going clubbing during, like, summertime in the LBC period. Yes. That was was basically (laughs) what it was. So, like, I grew up the youngest cousin, so I always wanted to go out with them. They go out, they go clubbing, they go, like, you know, they were all hip-hop. So I I, I loved loved that culture, so I definitely was influenced by Bay culture. My brother Andy was a Jabberwocky. At one point, he was working with Jabberwockies and doing stuff like that. So, you know, we grew up around a lot of dance culture, like hip hop culture. And yeah, I grew up around dancers, Filipinos, you know, you know what Shout it out is. To the Filipinos <laughs> in the Bay, yeah. they're deep over there. Yeah. yeah. I didn't inspired. know your brother. I didn't know your brother's Jabawakis. So I'm learning some some new thing. That's amazing. I, yeah, I was watching, watching the Jabawakis. <laughs> yeah, we, us too. I mean, because like Jabawaki history is all over like Northern California mm-hmm. and stuff like that too. So like all that dance culture, you know, Janet Jackson, all that from like a, from like young age, we were watching mm-hmm. all that. So like dance culture was big to us. Music, like hip hop, all that stuff. So yeah, that was that's basically how we grew up. And it was really really fun. I love the Bay still. I miss it. So. Oh yeah, much love to the Bay. Thank you for sharing that piece of history. You said you're the youngest. No, I'm the oldest actually. I'm the bong. So, the bong. Oh, okay. And I got held to all the high standards, like all the other Kamai kids. 
and yeah. everyone else has to do whatever after. But it's okay. It is. It is. What it is. <laughs> <laughs> it happens, you know? I'm the bo. I'm the bo. So I'm, I'm the baby. I'm I'm not, I'm <laughs> yeah, my, my my parents like spoiled me. They, you know. Yeah, so. <laughs> you know, that's, it's like different, right? The bong is usually the one that's like super independent and does like mm-hmm. some stuff, and the bo is the one that gets away with everything. So you're, yep, exactly. It makes a lot of sense that you're the bo. <laughs> so um your your parents like your mom is very supportive uh tell me about your mom she just followed me on twitter shout out to me not <laughs> she's really hip so, to like social media so I, I love it yeah so my mom and dad they're okay so when we when we were growing up they were they're both really like big music lovers we grew up it was our thing it was like music after dinner not like karaoke came in later, but it was like music, music, music. And they were, they were super cool. So my mom, she has a crazy, amazing story. Um, she basically, my parents were refugees. They came to the United States in the eighties, 1980. And then, um, you know, they came with the clothes on their back. My mom, um, she in like, she went to a community college art. We had like uh, some sponsors. They had to go to a community college. They asked her what you want to do. She said anything that doesn't speak English. And she got into, um, they said do data entry because it's just typing. And this is like right in the 80s. So Silicon Valley is just popping off. It's just about to become what it is. And basically she grew from like a data entry person with an associate's degree. Oh, she didn't have an associate's degree. But like, anyway, she grew from like community college in Sacramento to a data entry person to like becoming a full-blown software engineer and then like work the entire Silicon Valley circuit. And at the same time, um, she's my big inspiration at the same time while she was doing her Silicon Valley thing, making good money and all that stuff. She was also like an activist for, um, a lot of uh, anti Khmer Rouge stuff when the UN was still recognizing Khmer Rouge as the, um, the, the main government of Cambodia. She was doing activism work. She was on Oprah. She did all this stuff, um, to represent Cambodian voices, Cambodian refugee voices. So I grew up around her doing that. And it was always really, really inspiring. And she participated in documentaries and then music and, and art with, from both my parents. And my dad is like the more musical one. My mom is the more like philosophy and the power of music one. But like two of them had a huge influence on me being like, okay, this is something. It, it was never their intention to influence me to be a musician, but it happened. So because they loved it, they loved it. It was our, it was our happy place in the family and like, my mom loves music. She loves kind of like lyrics. She loves the power of music. She thinks it's, you know, she's, she's, she can dance. They both can dance. They both got like their twist and Maddie's on down. So like one of the early music videos I did is it's the real story of like the song that they used to talk about. Like that's all real dialogue of them just being like for real about talking about the, all the memories I remember growing up about Cambodian like identity it was never about Khmer Rouge. It was always about the good times, the supri party and like, you know, going out, being cute and that kind of thing. <laughs> so, you know, they, they had a big influence in me and my mom is my partner in crime. She, all the music we wrote together and like, I wrote the music, she'd write like the lyrics and stuff like that. And I'd write melodies. So yeah, she's my partner in crime. She's my big inspiration and she's been the, the true like Yoda type source behind me. That's like, yo, do this. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's my mom. Shout out to yeah. your mom and dad. You know, that's uh, they sound very uh, sound like you guys have a very good relationship, and they're both like uh, inspirational to to you. You know, yeah. And like about my dad, he like all of a sudden when I was like fourteen, he um just like randomly picked up a microphone and started singing. And he was super good, and then he like just blew up and then joined all these Cambodian bands in like Portland, Oregon. Shout out to Portland. He was in Seattle for the Big Fine New Year and stuff like that. Wow. So he. He loves to sing too, and he's super good. He's a much better singer than I am, actually. So, wow, you know, so music has been in the family for a long, long time. They I was love about it. to say, music runs in your family, then. That's amazing. Yeah, but it's not the main thing. It's not the main thing. It's just the thing we did for mm-hmm. fun, not, not to like, they all did different things. My dad's a mechanic at United Airlines. So, yeah, so it's very, very different, kind of like, it's a happy place. I think that's why it's in my life right now, because it's like the happy place. Wow. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I was just getting right into the next question was what first got you into music? Like early on, was it your parents or were you like uh, on TV watching 
like MTV? Like what 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 song was like that? Yo, this is I love. I want to sing. I'm okay. So when I was young, my parents would play like the Beatles, Santana. That was big. Like Santana was really big in our house. And like, I loved like the guitar parts and all that kind of stuff. So Creedence Clearwater, that's what they were playing when I was growing up. And then there was always like Thai music and Khmer music. And then there'd be like, you know, Khmer music would always be like time with my yay. And we'd be listening to like Sinsies and Morton stuff. But that would always be like time to like, uh, I didn't really like it at the time because it was time for it. We'd listen when we doing chores. I'm like, I had to do chores and do this and do that. So I'd be like, oh my God, again. <laughs> and I didn't get it yet. I didn't get it. Um, it wasn't until my cousin who's, also my bassist in the Like Me is my first band, um, my cousin Helena. She showed me Lauren Hill when I was young. And like Lauren Hill just blew me away. And then she gave me the, the iconography of it all. She's Lauren Hill was originally with the Fugees. Mm-hmm. And I was like, the Fugees, like we're refugees. Like that's so cool. So it was like the very first kind of group and artist that spoke to me. And then, you know, Lauren Hill, she's a killer lyricist. And she would speak all this, you know, the lyrics is always kind of like, dissecting society and all that kind of stuff so when i saw that and she could play guitar it was this one thing she did like i got peace of mind on mtv unplugged or something like that i remember watching that and i was like this is the shit this is the coolest shit i've ever seen in my life so much swag and like i was like oh my god it's hella cool um but it it wasn't like the thing that was like I wouldn't say that it was like, I want to be a singer. I mean, I used to like wash dishes, play music and like perform with the dishes. But like, uh, I, I never thought I was going to be a singer. I just liked to, to do it. But that that music made me feel heard for the first time. I felt seen like because I felt like as a Cambodian kid growing up in even though I grew up in an immigrant, like mostly Vietnamese, Filipino, Mexican part of town in San Jose. We were still like Cambodians are always like the really random one. You know, like the like four Cambodians by the tree and then everyone else is the other Asians. Right. right. And like, so I, um, I always kind of felt invisible, whereas like and then when, when I heard Lauren Hill, it made me feel like, no, 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 we're uh, other people are refugees, too. So that's cool. So that, that hit me really, really hard. I loved it since I was young. I loved her lyrics. Lauren Hill. Lauren Hill is like a true icon. Yeah. You know, like. Like she has so many great music, and she she's a great vocalist, and she also don't sleep on her rap skills. She's a spitter too. Like, Ooh, spin that knowledge. She's a, she's a yeah. killer. She like I still think she's one of the most prolific writers in terms of bars. She like can she spit crazy bars. Mm-hmm. And like, oh my god! Like she was like solving injustice. Yes, all her. that yeah. Mes- wow. music with a message. Like wow, I'm glad that yeah. you mentioned. Uh, Fuji's and the refugees now like it puts everything together like well that's a cool name you yeah. know I oh, thought yeah. you know Fuji's was like I thought it was just a cool name now it's like it's short for refugees I'm like okay yeah, <laughs> yeah. And all explained to me by my cousin and I hope that that's all right because I grew up thinking that but like um dude it was it, it just it really changed my life and like I was like okay and then you know when I was growing up then there was a period where it was like Michelle Branch on guitar and stuff like that and all these like girls came out I love, Michelle. I love Michelle yeah. Branch. I had like the biggest crush on Michelle Branch when yeah. I was a kid. <laughs> she was so cool because she was also, um, she was just like, she looked Asian. That's why I was yeah. like, oh, maybe, you know, and I was like, okay, this is it. This is cool. I loved her music. loved the singer songwriter thing. And then, yeah, my mom, I remember when I was young, I asked my mom, we were watching a Santana like concert. And she's like, he's so good. Da, da, da. And I was like, mom, how come there are no girl guitarists? Is it like girls can't do that? And she's like, no, they can do if you can do it. And then, you know, she challenged me like my mom. She's like, mm, that must be if you can do that. So then the next day, I was like, I think it was like a couple of days after something like she bought me a guitar. She bought me an acoustic guitar. She said, I'm not going to pay for your guitar lessons. But if you can figure out how to play it on your own, then we'll see if you can do something. So she was like, you can do it, too. But I'm not gonna pay for any lessons. You're just gonna have to figure it out yourself. So like, wow. I was like, okay. okay, mama. But she knew. I think she had a, an inkling that I wanted something or whatever. So she bought me that. And thank God there was the internet back then, so you could learn. Wow. I love how your mom's so supportive in your music, but she also makes you want to, makes you earn it. You know, and just like try to like yeah. you know learn it on your own, which is which is dope. That's what a good mom do, should do. You know. Yeah, she's and- she's. She's quite a Khmer mom. Like, she's pretty liberal in her, like, she's progressive with her thoughts, but she's still Khmer mom. She's like, I'm not going to spend money on some you being a lazy ass. You know, <laughs> you, you, have, you have to show me you, you could do it, you know, and you have to earn it with her. So, 
But yeah, it was, it was, I think, yeah, that's what made her a good mom. She's like, she's there for you, but she's like, mm-mm, show me what you got. I love it. So you got your guitar, you started learning. What was like yeah. the first song you ever like uh, played and uh, wrote and recorded and stuff? Like when did you get into recording and just being on like, I think I saw like a YouTube video a long, long time ago, like yeah. maybe plus 10 years ago, you were, you were on yeah. YouTube singing. I'm like, who is this? Killing it. Yeah. Oh. Um, okay, so first song I ever learned uh, was officially Missing You, actually. Um, like, I have to give it up to the Filipinos in San Jose because they definitely taught me a lot. Like, I learned a lot about music from Filipino friends and stuff like that. So it was good. It was great. And it's, it's, that's where I learned to, like, really love it. But the first song I recorded, uh, it was, uh, well, actually, there's one song on YouTube that's, like, really hidden there called Smoke Weed. I wrote that in college, but I didn't record it. That's the one like, I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that one's a little bit embarrassing. Like I go back and I'm like, oh, shit, I can't believe this is on the internet. But you know, that was when I was in college, and yeah, I was smoking weed. It's cool. It's, I mean, you know, whatever. I, I think we all go through that. Yeah, yeah. The first song I recorded was Capro uh, Henrico Pri. So that one was I wrote this song. It was like like quick, quick little love song. And then I, was, I remember it was like I went to with my mom. It was after college. I'd come back from I think I was on break or something like that, and I asked her do you want to record a song? And do you want to, do you want to help me like write a Kumai song? Because I've never seen it done before. And she's like, yeah, I can do it. Just <laughs> give me the, give me the lyrics and let me see what I can do with it. And then she ended up, my song was really stupid. And then she wrote this like really beautiful, like my love song. And it was really pretty and beautiful Kumai words and really girly and stuff like that. And then we recorded it in San Jose um and then we did a music video with just like my friends and like we had a real house party that music video is a real house party and i'm walking through the house party with a camera and like a lamp like like a, the, the light on me is like a lamp the guy's just holding it wow. shout out to ryan for shooting that music video but like, I, think I, rem- yeah. I think i remember that video too yeah um, it was it was it was all like this idea of just like let's just put this on youtube to be like yeah my people can make original music because you know, when I was young, I, I, it really made me feel kind of invisible that we didn't have original music. You know, I looked, I mean, even like v- Vietnamese kids had really cool, they had like Paris by Night, this really cool like Vietnamese show. And it was like music and fashion, all this stuff. And like everyone else had music. And I was like, oh man, how come we only have karaoke? So mm. I, it did make me feel extra invisible when I was young. I think that's definitely kind of a big inspiration for making the music. And it's just like no more being invisible like I want to feel heard I want to feel known I want to feel like there's someone out there like me or something so then when I was doing it it was just to prove a point that was that was the original intention just to prove one point it was not meant to be this whole thing but you know things happen I agree that's that's why I admire you so much like you know original music is important you're doing you're doing great things with it and we definitely need more uh, original music in the in the cambodian music scene so yeah yeah, yeah. And, and it's and it's growing now like it's like fully changed like i think mm-hmm. i think that's the thing that one of the things i'm most proud of to see that in the time that i've come from Cambo- like from from america to like a song in a garage at a real party to now it's like it's been incredible growth for Cambodia and the Cambodian artists here, Cambodian artists abroad as well. Like mm-hmm. it's the norm now. It's not the, ex- you know, it used to be the exception. Now it's the norm and copied music is the ex- exception. And people are like, man, I don't like that. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's the thing that it made me realize that, you know, when I was growing up, the thing that always brought me and my family together was music. The way we stayed con- connected to Cambodia was music. Even though it was karaoke, when Brip Sabat came out, you know, Brip Smoke came out with, uh, <laughs> um, uh, the song that was like the Danaman and Trapman and Trapman and Trap. He wore like these tight skinny jeans. Yeah. And like it was a happy song, but it was the first time he like danced in skinny jeans. And I remember like how my family was. They're like, oh snap, this is it. We're changing. And it brought people <laughs> together. So it's like from a young, from a young age, even until now, I realized that music is just like that medium, especially with YouTube and, and Facebook mm-hmm. now. It's that medium that's super easy to share and make you feel close to your own people. We're all over the place. We're in the homeland. We're super disconnected to uh, Khmer's in America, to Khmer's in Australia, to Khmer's in France. Like we all have different cultures. And before they were just like separate little ecosystems growing. But, you know, this is that moment and music can serve a really important like role 
to bring those people together and like and, and share different experiences because my American experiences are totally different to my experiences here. My Australian experiences are different. My French experiences are different. And like the, you know, how we all split up is kind of, a, I think it's kind of like a beautiful thing. Like we split up because of horrible things and we'll come back because of wonderful things. So I think that's something beautiful. So yeah, something like that. I love that. Like the evolution of Kamai music, cause like, like a few years ago, like maybe like eight to 10 years ago, it was like all like karaoke videos and stuff like that. Like with the Prips yeah. and Lots. And now it's a lot, yeah, a lot of original music pumping out, like almost on a weekly basis now. Like I've seen, I'm like, wow, what? Cambodia turns up now. I'm like, okay, I'm loving it. I love to see it. That's growth. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's something that I think Cambodians can pat themselves on. The, it's like we have small wins, you know, like we get little tiny wins in here and there. And I think it's important we celebrate those wins because it's a big win for to us for us to stop saying, hey, everything out there in the world is better than what we have. And to be like, no, no, no. We got cool shit too. That's like a huge step, I think, from like an existential point of view, from a philosophical point of view. It's a really huge step. And I think like how we, you and I grew up, especially like in America, my, like what I hope to see with, especially with Baramaya and stuff like that is like our kids, our generation, like the kids that will come from us and all the people who are having kids now, they'll have music that they can reference to be like, this is Cambodian music. It's all ours. And there will be no question. There will be no oh, this is copied or not. There is no question. This is just Cambodian music. That's that's a big, I think it's a big, big step for the culture and just for Cambodian people. It's a good sign, very good sign of better times, better prosperity. I don't know. Good shit coming. Yes, I love stuff. it. And I'm, I'm here <laughs> for it, you know? Yeah. So, um, Laura, what, what what's your creative process like when creating music or... Do you write your lyrics yeah. first? Do you uh, do you write the beat or that you play the guitar? Give us a little, you know, is there a secret you got? Do you, you drink a uh, tea and be like, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah right, right, right. Um, okay, so it depends on what kind of beat it, it comes out. Like if it's, if I start with a guitar, it's always going to be some emotional song. Like all the emotional songs come from the guitar first. Um, and that starts with like just basic chords and, and lyrics and stuff like that. Um, but what I, I think that like, especially in recent years, what I really love to do is produce. Like I really love producing. So I love to start on, I use Ableton. That's my, that's my favorite program of choice. I like Ableton mostly because of the time warping. And the reason I like the time warping function is because um, I, before when I was in America, I used to listen to my samples and I love my samples. So it's, it's like, we have all this good music and like when you if you really study hip hop, there's so there's so much based on history of sampling and it's a form of preserving while evolving. And if you can find where the sample comes from and all that stuff, it's like people get really nerdy about that kind of stuff. Right. And in hip hop and stuff. So but um, I started with Ableton because I used to take samples off of YouTube for any kind of my sound I liked because um, I love I love messing with my sounds. I think it's a I think we have a sample treasure trove in Cambodia that's pretty much untapped and like it's 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 a really really cool thing and I think it's starting to come to life a little bit um so I like to I used to start with that with samples and then work on machines so I'll like hook up my machine which is like a controller pad to Ableton dock and then build beats around it um but then when I got to Cambodia and of course when I had access to starting bottom money and all that kind of stuff I started to meet all the musicians on the ground and stuff like that and there's like one from one musician from one of my artists, uh, his name is Fantan from B-Band. He's like a master, he's like a master Khmer musician, um, Khmer instrumentalist. And he like learned everything on his own, but he's been working at the Khmer Circus at FAR um, in Siem Reap for a long time. And he does like all the arrangement, all that stuff. So he does crazy shit on Ronit. Like he can hip hopify Ronit. He can, he can do anything. He's really, really crazy. So now I have access to real Khmer musicians for, for sounds. And, and I have also access to really great Khmer vocalists out here like I did one song called Fate um, with Vanda and then with Meta. Meta is also a performing group in Simri but the vocalist in the beginning of the song has a crazy haunting vocal and like I, I it haunted me when I first heard it and, and how I heard it was Vantan sent me like a video of them in like the province with like chickens in the background and them just like doing the little drum thing and being hella cute 
And then um, I heard that vocal and it like gave me chills. So I was like, okay, you want to come to the studio? And then when I when they came in the studio, they gave me these big fat vocals. We gave them big reverb and all that kind of stuff. Anyways, so that whole thing, like that's my favorite thing to have happen. And when we did that, the song popped off. People really liked it. I could see that people also really liked you know, those old Khmer sounds coming into your living room, they evoke emotion, right? And like, mm -hmm. so my my favorite thing, the thing that's like, if, if going back to the creative process, I like to find Khmer sounds that evoke emotion because like I, like, I really believe that like Khmer people, I was talking about this with a friend the other day, is that like being Khmer is actually to know heartbreak, I think. And it's like, it's hard. Wherever, whatever Khmer situation you're in, there's always been some sort of heartbreak you've had to deal with. And I don't mean just like love. I mean, your parents, PTSD, the war, mm -hmm. poverty, gangs, whatever. There's like all kinds of things that have happened. Injustice, all these different things that Khmer people face. Being invisible is also kind of like a heartbreak. And like, I think when you hear those Khmer sounds, like, I don't know if it happens to you, but there's certain sounds that just like make me cry like, like that. And I'm like, oh, my totally, Khmer heart is broken. I totally yeah. agree and I understand like, Growing up, I'm hearing like my parents play like traditional music. Like, like I don't even I think it's the chape or the flute is like so puro, you know. And you can feel that. Like, yeah. I, I totally feel understand what you're saying. You can feel the emotion in the instrument. So, I love our, our you know like the traditional Khmer sounds, whether it be wedding music, rabam music. Is like I, I I sampled a couple of rabam beats too. So for my music, for my rap songs, so it was like you know yeah. like there's an unlimited amount to sample from. But you know like I feel like there's this unlimited potential on what we can do with the like you said, it's like a preserving and sampling, preserving, but evolving. And that's a quotable. I like, I like that a lot. So Yeah, I think there's a lot of nervousness on the ground when it comes to the arts or Khmer. There's a lot of nervousness about like preserving. And it's important to preserve. It's absolutely important to like have it in its normal format. But it's also fun to experiment. Like experimenting mm -hmm. is how you keep it alive. Like staying alive is keeping the music, keeping those traditions alive. Mm -hmm. is also in the experimentation and like allowing people to allowing different formats to enter like mm. the beat flip for example in hip, hip hop is a really powerful tool for music because you can switch between genres now now songs are like multiple genres in one song and the, the mm. beat flip changed that right? before it was like four minutes of the same thing like verse chorus verse chorus bridge verse chorus mm. and like now it's just like i don't know what's gonna happen because it's like music that's made for streaming is all about how um, how quickly you can interest and keep the interest of the listener, right? So right. anyway, so yeah, I, I think that those those Khmer sounds, like even if like you have never grown up in Cambodia or you have zero connection to Cambodia and you're, you're Cambodian and don't have a connection to culture, when you hear it, some, I, f I feel, I don't know, I don't think there's like a scientific, you know, kind of explanation for it, but I feel like there's like a DNA thing that happens on the inside that's just like, that's me. And like you feel that, connection to home and I think that feeling that connection is important especially for Khmer people that feel disconnected to the culture and stuff like that and I think this is interesting for I get a lot of messages from Khmer Americans that are like how do I stay connected and it's like music and they, they listen I know they listen to the music because it's like they just want to feel something and like this is mine even though I don't know exactly what it is it's mine so um, so yeah, that, that's what drives the creative process usually is like, I want that sound that's going to be like, damn, that's mine. Like, okay. And then a little bit of modern, you know, beats, 808s and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I like to sprinkle that on it. So I love yeah. It. So, Thank yeah. you for sharing me your uh, creative process. Yeah. So Laura, who would you most like to collaborate with? Ooh. Um, who would I most like to, like, like in a song, like... Yeah, in okay. a song, as, as an artist. I'm asking as an artist. We'll get to the CEO talk soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, honestly, I really like to collaborate with Snoop Dogg. Yeah? <laughs> I <Legend>. love Snoop Dogg. <laughs> his, I just love the way... I love his... Okay, first of all, Snoop Dogg is from LBC. And LBC has such a big... Khmer, like, there's a there's a Khmer-ness to LBC. No matter what you want to say about Long Beach, there is Khmer-ness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, I think we all, at least I grew up listening to Snoop Dogg and like he rep LBC and I had cousins in LBC. So I was like, I'm a rep LBC. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, so Snoop Dogg to me and he's, and like, whatever he does, whatever he does, he sounds good on. He can just put his spin on it. And I would love to hear him on like a Khmer beat, like a sick ass Khmer beat. And yeah. 
you know, like just like do some fun dance music because my people love to dance too. So I, I'm sure he'd do something really cool. And there are times where I'll admit that just for fun, I'll find like the the dry sample of his voice and throw it on a track just to see how it feels. So Snoop Dogg, if you're listening, fuck yeah. Speaking to existence, <laughs> a, a lot of my Snoop Dogg track would work. I've seen him do pop. You know, Snoop is a, he's a good uh, artist. Like he could, he's been on pop songs and he makes it work. He's like the special yeah. sauce. <laughs> Yeah, I mean Snoop Dogg, and then like I really like to bring in Paris Gobble to do fucking uh, Paris Gobble, the choreographer from New Zealand from Royal Family, to do all the all the dance stuff, dude, because they're so good. And like I think there's a lot of cool crossover with my dance. And anyways, fun stuff, fun stuff. That's like that's all on the the dream palette. <laughs> what would you be doing right now if it wasn't for your music career? I was planning to go into archaeology and anthropology. Like my plan was to be like a Cambodian, like academic. Like I wanted to, where I was, I was working in conservation and preservation with global heritage for a while at the Dei Chuan site, and that was what I wanted to do. I knew I always wanted to be involved in Khmer culture because I loved, I loved Khmer culture, and I, I really got obsessed with it and the history and stuff like that. So like my side, my side thing is Khmer history. It's really exciting. I think there's so many stories similar to how like music has been like a treasure trove of like unsampled sounds. There are also so many Khmer stories that haven't been told. Like. A lot, a lot. Oh my God, we have like centuries of history that is really, really cool. Um, so I'd probably be like a historian or something, and 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 maybe get in, and then I'd probably get into film because I love film too, mm. and and see if we could do like 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 for example, Raya just came out and is really, really great. I loved it, but I'd love to see like a purely Khmer story, like a very like a true true. Because there's a lot of good stuff. There's a lot of good stuff. Um, so I'd probably get into film too. So. Yeah, something like that. Or a lawyer, because we really need infrastructure here in Cambodia, because, yeah, it's, it's a little intense. But, mm. yeah, there's infrastructure building that needs to happen, legal kind of things that, need, that, that are not bad things. They're just good things to help balance, like, royalties, intellectual properties, stuff like that. So that would be more realistic. <laughs> wow. So you mentioned getting into film, Laura. I remember, like, I want to say maybe three or four years ago, you dropped a visual album. That's very epic. You did, like, a whole visual album. And that was, yeah. uh, I really liked the way that every song had a music video. Can you tell a little bit about that? Yeah. Take me through that. Yeah. Um. So, I mean, that, you know, the sad part about Awaken album is I dropped it on the day that Donald Trump was elected. And that was, like, just bad for the algorithm, man. It was horrible. Mm. But... Besides with that, I was really happy with that project. Um, and, and the thing is that I, I actually have really come to love film. And like at Barmay, for example, we do a lot of like crazy music videos and stuff like that. We really do like to push the edge on film. And a lot of that is attributed to Andy more so in his like vision and stuff. Um, but it, it is like at the heart of what we do. Um, and kind of like, you know, when I did that, that visual album, it was a little bit like, Uh, I would say a little bit too forward for the time period that it was in, but I was super inspired by Lemon, uh, Lemonade by Beyonce. She did the visual album mm. as well. And I was really inspired by the format and how it, it was released and all that kind of stuff. And um, with Awaken, it was kind of, you know, me bringing in all the different elements of, of, of all the like mythology that I really love. I love Moni Megala and the story of, thunder and lightning and the, the spiritual connection to it. And also the fact that it's a, it's a story about power. It's very much a story about power. And I think, um, and, and like, you know, how power can really change people and how the, the album was a mix of, it was a kind of a dissection of, I, I won't tell you, like, I'll tell you later another day what the secret meaning of the, the, the album is about, but really it was a dissection for me of power dynamics and how that works in Cambodia how it works in relationships, how it works in the soul, like with yourself. And, and then this, there's like a spiritual kind of thing that comes with power and stuff like that. So um, I featured heavily the story of Moni Mikala into the little bits and pieces and um, kind of just wrote an album about, you know, when you're having a hard time, when you're, when you're trying to process something really difficult. Um, and then when you've dealt with a difficult power dynamic in your life, Life, and that can be anything and I meant it to be open-ended in terms of any power dynamic that's unfair, unjust, um, painful. Um, 
yeah, I basically kind of wanted the whole album to reflect what healing looks like and like what dealing with that is, what coming to terms with unjust injustice really means for Cambodians. Um, and I'll leave the meaning at that. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I wanted to mention that because I remember like just the visual quality. It was like, damn, game changer. I felt like it was almost kind of like the the turning point in like cinematics and in, in, in music and like uh, music. It was like a movie to me, <laughs> you know? So like, yeah. wow. Cambodia uh, thank turning up. That, unfortunately, the album, it really didn't go very far. And it was just mm. too, it was too crazy, but it was fun to shoot. And I'm, I'm really proud of it. I'm really proud of it as a project. But um, yeah, no, it was, it was, it was an experimentation because I think a lot can be done with film. Like film is, is beautiful because it's a storytelling mechanism, right? Like songs is like from the ear and then film is from the eyes, right? Mm. So when you put the two of them together, it's like this really beautiful, magical thing that can, that can happen. And I think that um, like storytelling is really important for Cambodian audiences, period. And I want to see this more often, too, from like the audiences abroad, the Khmer audiences abroad, the, the Khmer artists that I'm, I'm watching from abroad, stuff like that, like yourself, even when it's in a comedic format, like that storytelling, like especially you did like, for example, you did the the monkey, the mom talking to mom talking to you, like stop drinking it with the monkey meme and stuff like that. But it was such a good story. It was such a good capture in the moment, in like true relationships between my kids and their parents. Um, it was just, it's super heartwarming and it just makes you feel immediately seen. I think that's the power of it. Like I, and I think that the more we push on film and stuff like that, like for example, uh, one of my artists, Fanda, we really pushed his skull album and we really pushed the visuals on his skull album. And the reason for doing that is like, we have to tell more complex stories. I don't know if you've seen most comp like most karaoke's are usually pretty simple storyline, you know. Yeah. Someone I hide behind a tree, be like, with a you know, bring her a flower. <laughs> I remember those days. <laughs> yeah, because I think that those karaoke's honestly are going to become vintage. They're like mm. really cool vintage, some vintage cool history that we have. That's hilarious. Mm. It has its hilarious. own hilariousness, but it's also sweet. And there's like simple storylines, right? But mm -hmm. um, I think that. Um, the more complex storylines we tell, I think I think that you know that has the ability to create more healing amongst Cambodians. Because I think I think a lot of Cambodians are also still dealing with transgenerational trauma. Like I think I've seen some of your other like viewers, like and and, and interviewees talk about PTSD and dealing with that in the family and what that looks like in Cambodia. What does that look like in especially Khmer Americans? Um, and then you know that shit is very real and and it's very it's tough to deal with. It's painful. I think people like in our generation, especially after COVID, are like really kind of like coming to terms with some of that stuff and like what's left over that you may have mm. may or may not have like inherited from your family. Not in a bad way, just in a way that's like, you know, broken heartedness to being Khmer. And it's like I think that film has the ability to heal some of those those things. It's, it's basically just something to watch where you can be like, I know that feeling and then mm. it feels good like i'm not alone just like that feeling of not feeling alone feeling heard feeling seen feeling visible those things are important especially now as like anti-asian hate is happening and, and racism and this like horrible things are happening in the united states like i'm over here and i'm watching and i'm still i'm heartbroken for like I'm, I'm scared for my family i'm scared for you know um all my everyone like my cousins and especially my nieces and my nephews you know they're all asian kids too and what are they going to grow up in right so in times like these, I feel like, you know, music, art, film, any kind of medium where we're connecting with each other and feeling heard and feeling seen is healing. And it's important. So. The whole anti-Asian hate going on. It's been going on. Yeah. But it was like yeah. last week with the Atlanta massacre, spa massacre, it was really heartbreaking. I, I, I was depressed. I, I didn't, I didn't want to promote anything. I didn't want, you know, I've, yeah. I felt like it, it didn't feel right. So, uh, try to you know take yeah. some time and do my part try to amplify the yeah. voices on my platform you know whether it's sharing links or sharing yeah. links to resources and i'm, I'm yeah. glad you mentioned it you yeah, know it's like, like you know we have to like really come together look out for each other you know and you know yeah i'm proud to see how many people are coming together and i'm amazed by it but i do think i do think especially my people like i do think we tend to silently deal with our problems rather than right. talk it's kind of like part of our grit 
it's like, you know, I've watched my parents be gritty through their pain and things like that. And like, they, they, they survived it. Like they, they dealt with it. It was there always, but they were like, I'm going to make it. And that was like a decision that they made. But like the talking about it aspect is, a, is another hard part. And I think that, you know, with just general ignorance and Asian hate happening right now, it's highlighting that for our communities. And um, yeah, so, you know, I, my heart is with all the people that are in America, particularly my people that are affected by it. And I hope, I hope that, you know, like there are mediums that we start to use more like the things that you've been doing and stuff like that, like or any kind of art mediums to heal because the healing part is really, really important. I think mm. it's the most important role that music and film and all of that has to play in this kind of stuff. Just, totally. So, that's that's yeah. why I do comedy. So I, you know, at least I could like make someone's day for it. Like even if it's a couple minutes, you know, like laughter is the best medicine, right? Yes. And it's, yeah, you know, I know it's it hard is. to laugh at during these times, but like at the same time, I don't want to be depressed for the rest of the year, you know, like, of course, yeah, we're going to yeah. fight. We're going to, uh, you know, advocate for change and stuff. But I don't want to change yeah. who I am. I just want to bring yeah. joy into people's life through comedy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it works. Like, I definitely, I mean, I've been following you a long time. And there are, I can tell you, like, every single time that I have commented, it is from, like, an actual Elmao. Like, I do laugh out loud. <laughs> like, I'm just like, what the fuck is this? And it's so, <laughs> it, it does do that. It really does. Like, I actually do get that kick of the day like okay everything is fine because this is a hilarious joke and then you kind of calm down from the pain a little bit you know so yeah keep doing what you do because it's 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 so important and and i i, I say that with all my heart like really it, it, it is so yeah thank you for the support i appreciate you that just that just made my day and i'm gonna have a kick-ass day yeah. <laughs> all right yeah. enough, in, enough with the sad talk but i'm glad you mentioned it it definitely needs to be discussed especially you know and it's just kind of sad that it had to happen on um, Women's History Month, uh, you know. Yeah. It's really, really sad. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to see. And I think, you know, I'm out here. I'm out in Cambodia where everyone else is Asian. So there's like, like it's not here, but it's there. And it's my heart is still breaking mm. from afar. So, you know, my heart goes out to everybody and hope everything's okay out there. So, yeah. Anyways, back back to happy things, right? Back to happy things. <laughs> Barame Productions. Yay. Let's talk about it, Miss CEO. Take me through your journey. How how did Barame come to life? And also the meaning of Barame. So that the viewers that may not know, like the Khmer Americans out here, Barame, it just sounds pretty to you. Barame, you know? Okay, so um Barame is again, it's me, it's a creation. It was founded by co-founded by myself and my mom. And it's a really, you know, I, I, of course, it's my own company. Of course, I love it and stuff. But the meaning behind Baramai, Baramai actually means sacred, holy power, right? So when you, when we pray in the temple and we, for example, when we like, if you take your Buddha to the temple and then the monks pray on it, they infuse it with Baramai, right? Like, so they give it protective power. When people get the sat, the tattoos and stuff, those tattoos have Baramai. Um, Baramai is, is basically like a holy power. Right. Um, but the, the meaning behind it, the, the like my mom and I did some real searching into the into the meaning. So the, the root of it is, is the word paramita, which is a Sanskrit word, um, which is the basically it means like transcendence to perfection right? through like your holy mission. Like if you have a holy mission and you like do everything, if you have right mind, right spirit, right soul, you put the right intention into it. That mission is going to be protected. It's going to be protected by that spirit and like you can do whatever you need to do you can actually move through life protected because you have the right mind the right intention the right soul and all of that so it has to do with self like if you can sell it's like so for example when you get the tattoos um you have to follow certain rules you have to cancel and um it's it's a really beautiful kind of like idea because my mom basically said you know after Khmer Rouge which she went through and it really had a horrible effect on her life, of course, back to the sad stuff quickly. Um, she feels that Cambodia was, you know, like blown apart, was really broken spiritually as well. And bottom way, like her, her, her original, like an our original kind of belief is that if we put the right mind, the right spirit, the right kind of healing and uh, intention into our goals with music, 
because music is just another medium to pass energy to people. And we infuse it with bottom line, then good things are going to happen in the country. Good things are going to happen on the ground. Good things are going to happen to my people and ourselves. Um, and so really the, the meaning and purpose behind it is that we want to bring back that sacred energy to Cambodian, just the Cambodian spirit. And I believe that music very much is part of the Cambodian soul. And we have to bring that energy back and we have to, you know, nurture it. And the more good intention, the more artists I get, the more projects we do, it's the more intention that we put into it, the better things are going to be for us. And it's, I hope that, you know, it's, it's very much a place for people and artists and stuff like that to be themselves, to put their, to put their full dreams, their full hopes, their full potential into it. And hopefully good intentions with, with whatever kind of, you know, when you when you're famous, you have a certain power, you can do a bunch of different things. You can represent causes. You can bring attention to causes. You can help people. You can make the people feel better. That's all energy. And I think that, um, bottom light is about all bringing in the really good energy and treating it with like enough respect and care to a level of like a sacred level that it will have a, a positive effect all around you. And, and that, that like little ripple that you do, maybe it's one song, maybe it's one little film piece or whatever, whatever artists work with does in any format, whatever you do is going to ripple out into the Khmer community and maybe beyond the Khmer community and bring good things to the world. So yeah, that's the belief behind bottom light. Um, and so, yeah, for, for bottom line, the, the story of like where we, where we came from is, is literally, you know, I got here on the ground and then a music, original music was popping up. I joined this movement of a lot of artists who were like, hell no, we're going to do original music. And, and then that became the norm. And then what I realized is the thing that's keeping from keeping Cambodians from really being noticed on the stage, like the international stage is actually not the level of talent that we have amongst Cambodian people. It's actually the infrastructural help that we, we, we are lacking. We lack infrastructure. Uh, we lack infrastructure for IP, royalties, things like that. But we also act like, if you look at most acts that are like really great international acts, they have great teams. You work with many creatives, you work with great collaborators and things like that. And because of the size of the market here, it's really, really tough for, for Cambodian artists to do all that by themselves. They can. They absolutely have, but it's better when you have a team. Anything is better when you have a team that absolutely believes in what you're doing. So we we went into it with that mindset. And of course, I, I was the first artist of my own label and I built a team around me and I realized how important it is to have a team. This Every single person on the team matters, including your finance, your everything, like everybody, whether it's admin work or not, they, it all matters. And then we started signing artists to help them achieve their goals with original music. And we went from Kling Mai, we've got Polarix, we have Vanda, who's really become like a game changer. And um, we have now Sophia as well, who I really hope is going to do some sick ass R&B, like, you know, bringing her English sounds to the world um, and being a Khmer artist from Cambodia, but singing well in English and that being okay. And so like, we really like to focus on artists that are unique and have capabilities, like really unique capabilities, and then bring that not just to my audiences, but hopefully to more international audiences as well. Um, so it's been an amazing journey. I've been on a really fun and amazing journey with my artists, and we've had a really successful run in Cambodia, and I'm really happy with the work that we've done so far. And yeah, we, we plan to keep expanding. Like I, I want to see Baramai, uh become something where, you know, who, our generation's kids know the name and feel good when they fit, when they see that name. I hope that they'll see it. They'll feel good immediately and be like, Oh, something nice. Like when you, when you watch Disney, you see that opening credit and it makes you feel good. That's what I hope for. Bob. So yeah, that's where we're headed. Wow. Congratulations on all your success so far with bottom main. And I was, you answered my question. I was going to ask you about your all-star roster. You know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Vanda. You know, he's, uh, he's killing it right now. Like I said, on. The K1J interview, I said he's a, the Drake of Cambodia. You know, if, if we yeah. had to, like, put an equivalent right now, I, th I feel like he's a future and really, like, um, leveling up and changing the, the game, raising the bar, <laughs> raising the bar yes. for sure. And um, yeah. he just did a song with uh, Sophia, like you mentioned. So that's a really good hook. That's a really catchy hook. I can hear that on, like, uh, American radio. <laughs> it's really catchy. Yeah. Waste you know, my they time. How's it go? Waste my time? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't wait. Um, 
But those, I mean, these guys are, I think this is what I, this is the thing that I'm seeing on the ground. And, and this is the big, the big, this is the big kind of like um, characteristic. And I hope the asterisk marks the bottom line, like we don't necessarily do all the like main national music. And there's so much good type of like things that are popular in national music and stuff like that. Right. I think you can hear it from the different types of songs. Like you did, you know, you recently did Ribs Watts, uh, Ribs Smoke, which was uh, <laughs> Gang, gang. Was <laughs> I'm gonna be real. Gang, 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 was a game changer. Like I thought that was uh, the shit. No. Anyways, um, <laughs> but I, I, we really focus on unique talent. That's one of the things that's really important to us. And of course, you know, I want to expand all the things that we do in terms of making music for national music as well. But like, we're really, really seriously focused on unique talent in Cambodia because here it's on the ground, and like what they're lacking is just infrastructure to actually make it out onto those Spotify playlists that Apple playlists and all that kind of stuff. It's actually about infrastructure. It's about audiences and having all the platforms that you, you have to be there on all of those platforms. And then it's not that Cambo that, that uh, the world is not ready for Cambodian music It's that Cambodian infrastructure is not ready for the world to receive it. So that's what we're in the, in the game right now to change. Like I want to, I want to see that change and it sounds a bit boring, but it's really, really important. The artists are, Kicking butt. I really love them. They're, they're like my little children and I'm so proud of them, especially, I mean, Vanda, he's just, he really has raised the bar and the fact, you know, this guy, so that everyone out there knows he makes his own beats. He writes his own hooks, his own lyrics. That's about he that. Is, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's artistic. And you know, the thing about him is that he's humble. He is humble. My God, it's so important to be humble. And I mean, I get a lot of messages from people who are like, how do I become like a singer? How do I become a rapper? I want to do this, that. It's like, dude, collaborate, be humble and like be patient. Like that's super duper important. He had all three of those characters. I actually met him when he was younger and we had talked about a career for him. And he, when I first met him, he was, he could barely like, he was so shy. He wouldn't say a word to me. That's how shy he was. And to where he's come to now, like he made his way, like he barely like took each step and made his way to get here. Um, so he put a lot of effort into it. And like all of the art, a lot of the, all the Barame artists have put a lot of effort into their music. And, you know, they're willing to take the steps to be patient enough to like get good. It's, mm. it, you have to be patient to get good. So like, yeah, man, he's very good. And, and I'm really proud of what he's doing. So. Yeah. Me too, definitely. I'm rooting for you, Vanda. And um, you can just tell by the way he uh, carries himself on his uh, IG lives. I've been, I've tapped in on him recently just to show him my, you know, give him my roses and props and stuff. And he's really uh humble and respectful and like, he seems like a sweet kid. <laughs> I don't know how old he is, but like to me, I'm a, I'm, I'm hella old now. Like, I gotta accept the fact that I'm old as hell. So, I, you know, he called me bong. It was like, you know, it was, I just think um, Cambodians in general are really uh sweet, you know? The way yeah. they talk, yeah. He, but he's he's pretty unique in that he's like um, he is collaborative. He's he's shy. He's actually shy, but he's also like a good jokester, and he like has this really hard look. But he's very kind of <laughs> reminds me of you a little bit. Like in the beginning, it's like you you know you were like hella chilly, hella all this stuff, yeah. and you had this persona, right? And then when you meet you in person, you're just like, hey. I'm hella nice. Ian, really. And people in real life, you're like, you're shy. I'm like, yeah, I'm yeah, hella Ian. Like, you. Very similar. Yeah. <laughs> and like really sweet, actually really sweet. And like just a nice person. And like, um, he's a really, really, I think that's the best thing about him. Is that he's actually very, very nice. Very, very, very nice. Like, and means mm -hmm. it. Like when he's your friend, he really means it. So like, it's, it's cool. I, I'm happy for his success because he does deserve it. And he's like, I'm telling you, humility is a very powerful tool. For any of the artists that are out there that are watching, listening, humility is 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 powerful. It's like it's the unstoppable force. That's bottom line right there. If you can stay humble, that's that's powerful. So yeah. Yeah. Shout out to your team, Barra May, killing it. Keep raising the bar, keep uh being good role models too, you know? It's more than music. Yeah. It's just like, you know, you guys are doing everything the right way and I'm I'm a fan and I'm a supporter and you know. Y'all going to the moon. To the moon, you guys go. To the moon. To Mars. <laughs> Elon to Musk. Mars. Yep. <laughs> Elon Musk. Yeah. And also, you guys do a lot of concerts and performances. What are some of your uh, favorite venues that you performed at? Um, gosh, man. I mean, that's like a it's like a sore point right now because 
uh, like COVID came and just destroyed the live industry all around the world. So, you know, I'm shout out to all peoples in the world that are working in any industry that's been just completely destroyed by COVID. Uh, but, you know, before COVID, um, I would say, you know, any in Cambodia, it was sad because there was like a real energy on the ground with concerts in, in Cambodia. Like before, I mean, COVID gave us a chance to go very serious into film and, and digital because that's all we could do, right? Mm. But, and I'm glad that we got that chance because then we got to do Skull Album in the way that it happened. Originally, it was supposed to be a big, you know, album launch and a big old concert. Um, so like my favorite, to, to answer your question, my favorite kind of concerts are, excuse me, like they're actually... Um, when it's like mostly college students, like almost all college students, if it's like the age is between like college to the drinking age, that's the best. They're, those are the best, best audiences in Cambodia because they're, they're hype. I, I really, for all the Cambodians that haven't been back to Cambodia, I do encourage you once to not, not to go to a beer concert, but go to like the college ones because, oh man, they are hype as hell. Like they are so hype. Uh, for me, my favorite one was um, I got to open the stage for Demi Lovato when she came to Cambodia, wow. and they did it out. On, they did the concert out on Gok Bay, uh, on Diamond Island, and it was like thirty thousand people, and like it was mostly young people, like almost all young people, and it was so much fun. Like it was like a full blown like roaring crowds, super crazy. I loved it. We also put on One River concert, so we did like an environmental concert. And then like all the kids came out and we celebrated the environment, but we went hard. It was like a hip hop and environment, which is not something that you would see often together, but it was super fun. Like, and we mixed it up, you know, like we, those are the best ones where it's like the artists come out and perform, they get the audience hype. And at the end we do like DJ sets and EDM sets where like literally the audience stays with us after the cameras stop rolling and we like party all night long. And it's like, everyone's jumping. It's like, there is like a, there is like this like Coachella vibe to it. Like yeah. for, for what's happening on the ground in Cambodia, that was before COVID. Um, but that's obviously no more. And like worst, did you say the worst venue? Like, yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, what was the least favorite venue you guys performed at? <laughs> I know everybody okay. has start somewhere, you know, like there was shows yeah. I did when there's like two people that showed up. So, you know, let us know yeah, that yeah. too. That's um, it's part of it. It's part of it. It also makes you good mm -hmm. at your, you know, when you have a, a really dead audience. Um, I, I won't say I won't say where it was, but I will say that it was a provincial concert. It was it was a tough concert because um, they put the concert they put the stage right next to a ravine in this Cambodian province, and it's like you know the concerts are full of lights, right? So it just attracted like a million bugs. So you basically we were doing that we were doing the show, and you would like inhale bugs, and it was like oh no. There are bugs in my chest. There are bugs in your eyes. And, you know, like, I'm a female performer. Like, I'm wearing lashes. I got weave in. Like, it's already difficult up there for me, right? And then when you, mm. got, when you got a bug in your eye while you're performing in front of, like, 5,000 people and, mm. like, bugs in your mouth, that, that's wow. not comfortable. Really not comfortable. <laughs> so Mosquitoes that was over there are vicious, I heard, right? The yeah, bugs? but people yeah. are these are like the bugs near the river, you know, like the ones that like fly around and get really crazy around lights. Dude, mm. that was that was a horrific show, but it was OK. It's fine. It's part of it. It's like mm. one of those things where it's like, OK, I got my chops. I've been to the provincial concert where bugs flew in my mouth. It's all good. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was, it was a little that's that's probably one of the worst ones, I would say. But, you know, for the most part, shows are really I love shows. They're fun as long as it's not like people who are who are dead. I, I hate a dead crowd when they're just like, I don't really want to hear music. And it's like, oh my, come right. on now. But I think it just depends on the age of the crowd, to be honest, and, and like how hyped they want to be. And I love, I also love a drunk crowd. They can be really fun. Out here, yeah. staff parties are really big. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when people get drunk, it's, it's fun. They get a little crazy, but it is fun. I'm going to say it's fun. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing your experience with, you know, doing performances. I feel performances are important. Like, I don't know, early on, like being like nervous when I'm when I'm performing, I didn't really like the performing aspect of it until like maybe like a couple years ago, you know. Because I still get stage yeah. fright. How do you guys deal with that stage fright? You guys just take oh. a shot or something, some Red Bull, and be like, "Hey, <laughs> let's go." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sometimes, sometimes a shot also opens mm. up your vocal cord. That's mm. just my belief. Mm -hmm. Actually, my dad taught me that. He's 
like, just take a shot of whiskey right before. I'm like, all right. <laughs> but I was a lot of stage fright. But I, st- I even I, I still get stage fright. I still get yeah. I still get it. You just got you got to power through it, and you got to power for power through the first note. So like almost always the first note of anyone mm-hmm. is going to be tough. You got to power through it. Just power through it, and like, um, yeah, you know, I think I think people still feel it out here, especially the big crowds. When you got a big big crowd, it's like oh snap, because mm-hmm. you got to you really have to bring your energy and lay it down lay it on the stage and be like are you ready but i go out and i i pray and then i i do my like find my inner beyonce and i'm just like <laughs> channeling queen b and i'm like all right it's all good and then you Get go out there, there and slay slay you gotta go out there and slay you gotta <laughs> give it right you have to just right. give them your energy you know as long as you're smiling at them they likely will smile at you back i think that's like one thing i want to tell like, young artists it's like just smile just smile it, like if you someone's smiling at you, you kind of like the audience like kind of like submits to smiling to you. So you're like, all right, let's go. That's so, a pro tip right there. I like that tip. That Definitely gotta smile because if you look yeah. uncomfortable on stage, they're gonna they're gonna feel uncomfortable for you. I mean, yeah, and then like if you look like they're having, you're looking at them having a good time, they will be confused into having mm-hmm. a good time. That's Indeed. kind of like yeah, definitely pro tip. And just look at their forehead. Don't look at the eyes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's one way. Okay, I'll take that tip for sure. Look at their forehead. Uh, yeah, I'll be looking down sometimes. So, thank you for the yeah. tips. I mean, and, you know, um, you know when me mugging you on the when mm-hmm. someone's me mugging you on the, on the floor, and you're just like, I just like to like really smile <laughs> really hard into like their mean mugging face into their mm-hmm. into their forehead, and then like I, I like watching them like submit to be like, <laughs> you know, so I'm like, all right. Submit, ooh, submit. Submit, Super I love fun. it. So I, I know that uh, COVID is, uh, you know, kind of it, it ruined like the whole performance industry. Um, I think everything's moving into virtual concerts. Do you have any upcoming concerts virtually? Maybe I could attend, be a fan or something and just watch. You guys looking into that? Virtual concert. Um, okay, so to be honest, I really, I love the fact that there are virtual concerts. It's good. But I think that it's become kind of like the only medium for artists. And I think that's tough. You know, it's tough. And like, of course, we would love to do a virtual concert. We, we, we like, we'd love to do that. But even that is still, from a production perspective, is still a little bit dangerous still, especially right now. Mm. Um, but like, you yeah, know, I mean, I, I'm with it. But I think I kind of have faith that the COVID situation is going to be handled sooner or later Hmm. and i'd rather like keep all that pent-up energy of all the people it's just like i really need to go see a concert and see live music again like keep that in their body and then when they when we meet each other again on the stage i know it's gonna go off so like i'm kind of like i I think for me like and for the artists as well like we're kind of like patiently waiting for that and i I think it's gonna happen like Hmm. biden just signed a a deal with um India to provide like a billion doses of Johnson and Johnson to Southeast Asia, which I'm really, really hopeful will benefit Cambodia heavily. So I'm, I'm basically right now, like on the way out. Like I, I, I think that I want all that pent up energy to like be released when we go do concerts again. I'm like, we plan to go all out and be hype as hell. And like when people come out, I expect them to lose their damn minds. That's like what I want. So yeah so i'm like be patient and like mm-hmm. go for it and, and for now what we'll continue to do is like do music videos and um you know put out audio releases and just like keep engaging with the fans but like concert time is it, it just for me maybe i'm a traditionalist but like it's like face-to-face time that's concert time um because there's nothing like that there's nothing like that electricity between you and your audience and mm-hmm. like yeah i, I want that energy so can't wait till everything gets back to normal. Maybe when I, I'm I can use bring my you passport. Out here. Yeah, I'm yeah, definitely going to be out there. Some hella chile, crib smoke. Yeah, I you never ask. I'm that, there, I'm there. The <laughs> I'm rich, I'm rich. <laughs> I don't know how you came up with that line. I'm broke, I'm broke. I'm winning like a broke. Yes. You know, I just had to keep it real with myself, you know. I want to have a, you know, like a, you know, back and forth. I did that all in good fun. I have a lot of respect for Prip Smoke. You know, it wasn't yeah. there to make fun of him. It wasn't there to uh, disrespect Cambodian music scene. Me, they, they, you know, I built my whole, th- you know, my whole format through doing parody. So I kind of like, hey, I haven't done a parody in a while. Why, why don't I do this? And hopefully they've seen no, it and they, they didn't, you know, think any bad feeling about it, you know. 
no. much respect to Galaxy Navatra and, you know, mm-hmm. Autumn. Yeah, I think it's endearing. Like, I think they should take it as a compliment, like, to be like, hey, let 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 music be loose. Like, if it's funny, it's funny. It's okay. That's fine, mm-hmm. you know? And it was, I think it was, it was endearing. It was funny. It was a perfect, perfect uh, parody collabo. In my opinion, <laughs> I mean, I died laughing on the floor. It was so oh. good. I thought you did a great job. You made it super cool. So, um, yeah, you know, and like, you know, one of our artists is the producer on that track and he loved it too. So he Shout loved it. Shout out to Grimes. Did. Credit yeah, to Grimes. Man, I love the I beat. Love I love the beat. Yeah. I'm a beat guy. So if I like a beat, I'm going to hop on it, you know? And that's a, I think so, that's like the highest compliment on a producer, yo. Like, it is. And yeah. you know, it's about, he is, he's like people, I think a lot of, I've seen some comments before people were like, yeah, but he copied music. Well, he also entertained the hell out of us while we didn't have the music, while we didn't have the exactly. music. Exactly. Facebook and YouTube so I got like when I came here I'm gonna be honest like I came here with like this like attitude like oh fuck you know the copied music and then the longer I was here the more I realized like oh wait a second no 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 no. we just didn't we just didn't have that infrastructure it had to take its time and those artists that came before us that did copy music they entertained people and we have to have respect for that like I respect it and I and they work hard those guys work just as hard as any other artist they put out as many songs and all. the medium they did it is a different medium. And that's not their fault. That was the system, you know, like it's, it is what it is. And so, and like Rip Subat, if you meet him, God, he's so funny and he's so charming. That guy is the ch- most charming, most again, humble and like just an amazing entertainer off the, t- off the stage and on the stage. Like he's just a very, very nice person, respectful in any which direction. Mm. And like I got to work with him on a Bebo commercial and he was, he's just like a legend. He really is a legend. He deserves all the respect that he has. And like, so, you know, when you did your thing, I was like, this is, this is like the most beautiful Khmer America and <laughs> Cambodia connection, like a way to just be hilarious together. So I thought it was brilliant. So that's the last thing I'll say about it. Yeah, that's kind of like my my way my interpretation. If Cambodia and what 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 can what could happen if I want to collaborate with my artist in Cambodia? I want to. I feel like we gotta just work together. You know, I don't know. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, some people did it, but I feel like it, it needs to happen more nor, nor more regularly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think it will, and I think like I think that's the next big step for Cambodian music is actually connecting with the diaspora. Like once the if. if I, I'm saying, like, I truly believe the diaspora and Cambodia connect like this. Our music industry, our, our just the general entertainment industry and, like, our arts and culture is going to blow up so big because we have, like, it's actually an advantage to have multiple perspectives in one nation. You know, like, it's an advantage. It's also some of the magic of America, despite all the things that are going on, when you look at arts and culture in America, it's like so many different types of perspectives and types of music. So, so it's like this explosion of everything, right? And that, and to be honest, still to this day, American music is top, top music of the world, honestly. And there are other markets that are doing great stuff, but like we do really cool stuff, honestly. And I think that what I like, me as a Cambodian American coming to Cambodia, what I see as the opportunity, not necessarily as a flaw, is that there are multiple perspectives in different countries. And when you share that culture together and you're open to it, if the audiences become open to it, I think we're going to have a really diverse, really diverse kind of uh, industry and do some cool stuff. So that's like a message out there to all those artists that are out there that feel disconnected. Like, stay in touch with us. Like, it's our plan to connect. So, yeah. Well, how do you feel the internet has impacted the music industry? Mm. Yeah. This one's an interesting one. This is one that I would love to actually even, like, go do, like, an academic study on. Um, so I think that the internet is, is a really powerful, God, is such a powerful tool, especially here in Cambodia. I mean, it, it brings in culture. So like all this like meme culture, troll culture, internet culture, gaming culture, like music culture, movie culture, all that stuff is now readily available to every Cambodian, like at any time, at any moment, at the touch of their finger, right? And, and so it's kind of like Cambodians have become extremely connected to world culture. So whether it's like BTS or Blackpink from from Korea, whether it's Bruno Mars, whether it's Taylor Swift or whatever, 
wherever it's come from, even Latin music or whatever, we have access to it, right? So, and that's this generation. So they're becoming, so the first thing that has happened is that the Cambodian listener is getting super savvy. They're starting to get really savvy. I think that like young people particularly have an open ear. They're much more open to it. I think the older generation is a little bit like, this is what I like. I ain't got time to listen to all this young people stuff. I got to do my work and that's fine. No worries. Do your thing. But firstly, I think that the listeners here are becoming savvy. The listeners abroad are super savvy. Um, And then what it really has been able to do is like, YouTube and Facebook are such powerful mediums. Like they're the most used platforms here in Cambodia. Like they're the main platform and like, and used heavily. Like, I think there's more people, like for example, TV has really kind of, it used to rule the airwaves, to be honest. Like if you wanted to be seen, you had to go on TV. Now you just need to go on the internet. And like that gave so many people like Vanda the ability to just connect, right? Um, And it doesn't matter if you're in, America or Australia, if you type in Khmer music into YouTube, you're going to find whatever is in that popular search and everybody's going to kind of get a sense for it. Also, this this like phenomenon of the reaction, I know you've been doing reactions, that that phenomenon of watching people react to your music, it's like a powerful, super powerful way to engage um, how people listen to music, how the parts that they like, the parts that they get bored at, like that shit is super amazing and, and what people like and like... Right now, for example, Vanda's audience has grown beyond Cambodia's borders. Like we have reactionists in Turkey, in Thailand, in uh, Laos. We have some in Japan. We have some in the Philippines. We have the UK. We have Africa. We have, um, I think, Ivory Coast or something like that. Yeah, like, I've noticed that yeah. on Vanda's reaction, he has an international reaction crew, which is uh, nothing but amazing for for the growth too. Like you know, it's viral. Yeah. It's like a snowball effect. So it's like wow, that's powerful. And I'm new. I just yeah. joined the reaction community, so I've seen the potential of like people reacting to my videos from years back. Like I didn't, and I didn't think I was gonna like try to do it. Yeah. I just didn't know where, where to start. But now it's like it's easy now. So I was like, and it's unlimited content. So I'm definitely gonna be reacting to a lot of your guys' stuff. And it's like yeah. you know unlimited, and it just helps each other out. It's cross promotion, you know, and um, that's what we need more support. Yeah. And then also, I think the really cool thing is that you know, for example. Like hip hop has a massive and incredible history. The, the, the story of hip hop is it has so much history to it. There's the rights movements behind it. There's a lot of stuff before you ever heard mumble rap or drill or whatever. There's a whole history that came before that. And then in the old days, I think, you know, the way that hip hop kind of came here, it's kind of like you heard the music and you didn't really know why, you know, certain things are, are, are like applauded and certain things are not applauded or flow and rhythm and the, the respect for all the little bits, bits and pieces and bars and the history of bars and even dissing like there's a history to all of it right mm-hmm. and like I think that reactions have helped people to kind of like learn the history along the way you know like mm-hmm. to be like oh wait let me tell you a story it's like hanging out with a homie and being like no no, no, no let me tell you how this shit came down how it hey how it came mm-hmm. to be and that's super powerful for the Cambodian listener so that they can really participate in the world music. Like, the, uh, I think that, like, um, the average listener in the United States is pretty sophisticated when it comes to, like, that kind of thing, you know? Mm-hmm. So, uh, and then that access to that information is just not available to the Cambodian listener before, and now it is. And people are dissecting the little bits and pieces that they liked, what they didn't like, how other people react to Cambodian music. And I do think it's starting to open up um, young Cambodian people's eyes, especially Vanda's music, is, is opening up people's eyes to the possibility that maybe, just maybe, Cambodia is ready. We are ready. We are ready to go all out. We're Let's ready to represent. Go. We're not going to be like forever that country that's just like the one that got bombed, the one that had a genocide. Like, we don't got to be that. And you know, the thing that I love about it is that Cambodia is the ultimate underdog. It's the it's the underdog. It's the warriors before they became the warriors. That's Cambodia. Like, sorry, that was super Bay reference. But honestly, the warriors really <laughs> sucked for a long, long time. But like, so <laughs> yeah, it's the truth, right? But but I, I think that like I hope that listeners, like especially bottom my fans, you know, and people who are fans of Banda and the music that we're trying to make, I hope they understand that vision of ours. It's like. We absolutely believe that Cambodia is ready. We just have to go out there and put the moves out. And we have to be courageous enough. We have to have the, the like, belief 
And it's going to take that kind of like level to like to get there. And we're seeing it. We're actually seeing it happening on the Internet. So the Internet is is crazy. It is really, really crazy. And I'll tell you an interesting fact about Banda. At one point um, last year when Skull released, he was the most Shazammed song in Laos. In Laos? Number one. In Laos. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. He was at the top chart of Laos. And like, you know, if you really think about it, have we ever had a connection with Laos? Like we have, we share a culture, but have we ever shared stages? Have we ever shared media? Zero. Not that I know of. So like, if you want to know what the internet is doing, it is literally opening doors, the doors that have never been opened to Cambodian artists. And like, I, I will say this to any artist that's out there that is Cambodian, like the time is right now. This is it. This is your moment. Like get out there, put your shit out there. Be serious about your social media and mm -hmm. and like do it because and like and and if you're serious about being on a platform, I really do hope um, and and quietly we have a plan to build a serious international platform for Baramai. Like be in touch with us, be in touch with you. Now you know what it is. Just like say hello because yeah, the only way we're gonna get better is if we team up, and that's the big one for Cambodia and like. Um, yeah, that's the spirit of collaboration that we have and we want to share it with you guys. So, yeah. So come on out. Show me what you got. That kind of thing. Wow. You heard it first here on Chile Talk. Send your applications yes. to Baramea. You know, I sent mine. Did you, uh, you know, I just want to check up on the status of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. don't, don't tell the folks what we cook in yet. Come on. Man. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, but I do agree, you know, like, Internet's changing the world, and I I love seeing like these young kids doing the drill because Western culture is will always be the influence for the world. And I'm not even a hater. I'm not even an old head. Be like, yo, mumble rap too much auto tune. I like auto tune. I like what these kids are doing. I like that they doing the the woo walk and the, you know the drill stuff. Like, yo, that's like you guys are, would fit in right here in New York. <laughs> I think one day we need you guys to do a concert in America and. Go crazy for us. I want Vandata stage dive. We'll catch him. It'll be lit. Hell yeah. That is that is absolutely on the plan. Like that is our goal, our plan. And like I don't wanna just I don't wanna just go there and bring Kamami. Like I, you know, like I know that we've done like I'm sure you've gone to like a concert, a Kamai concert before. It's pretty much set up like a wedding, right? Mm -hmm. Like you if you like go to like Fu Lam restaurant, have like there's Hennessy on the table, there's a round table, fits 12 people, there's a stage way at the back, and then there's a concert, and then sometimes people will go to the middle to dance. Right. That's your average Khmer concert in America. But like when we go and I, my, my hope really is that when we go and we get to meet with, with like the fans out there and, and anywhere that we throw a real freaking concert and we have ourselves a real damn party. Like like not not just like the wedding style, but like a real concert where we really get down. Like, like the one we went that the last one we did in L.A. together, uh, Cambodian Music Festival. Yes. Um, you know, that was that was an incredible it was a shout out to the organizers. They did a really, really good job. And like, it was so much fun and the energy on the ground was the spirit. That was the spirit. And I want to, I can't wait to get back to America and bring my artists out there and, and just like, just go all out, get hyped, get hyped together. Just have a damn good time because it's been COVID way too long. And we need oh to yeah. It feels like it's yeah. never ending. CMF was fun, you know, you know, it was, it was a really yeah. good experience and meeting you and everyone else. Yeah. Yeah, I'm hoping to bring you out. I'd love to bring out Kamai Wojibet. I'd love to bring out, like, you know, the, the, I know there are artists out there in, in America that are doing the thing and have, like, no support. So the point is that, like, we all have to, kind of, like, really organize. We have to start supporting each other a lot more, like, and connecting, like, having the courage to connect. And then, you know, there are Kamai American experiences. There's Kamai Australian experiences. There's Kamai French, Kamai Korean, Kamai Thai, Kamai whatever. There's all kinds of experiences. And I like would love to see all those stories come to light. Yeah. So collaboration. That's the dream. That is the dream. So yeah. I agree. And dreams do come true. Let's get it. Yeah. Michelle. Michelle. So Laura, when you're performing, what is your most favorite song to perform of yours? Well, I think okay, it depends, right? So like um well, my favorite to perform on a big, big stage is 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 opening with Wong Suo. So I did this like EDM drop with a, a my prayer song to open the stage, and it's still the fun. It's like the one that gets everyone hype, and I love like dropping. I love a I love dropping a big beat. It's my favorite thing to do. I love watching people be like, "I'm ready for the beat," and it drops, and then they just like mm -hmm. lose their shit. So like, I love that. 
I love, uh, it's a cover, but Kim and Such a Day is really fun to sing in the club. So like that one's really, really fun because peeps, especially drunk people, they just like go all out and like, Yum and Such a Day. And it's <laughs> like, hell yeah, <laughs> have a good time. But um, yeah, those ones are my favorite still. They're, 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 they're fun. I love the other ones too, but those ones are the most fun to, to perform. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. So, Laura, which which famous musicians do you admire? I know you mentioned Lauren Hill already. So, any yeah. any others? And Michelle um, Branch. I love Michelle Branch, by the way. <laughs> I know. Um, well, I really love... Uh, okay, well, I love Dr. Dre. I love Dr. Dre just as a, as a, as a general idol because I, I love what he's been able to do from a business perspective. And like Wu Tang Clan was a big inspiration for me when I started Barame, uh, Barame Production and Barame Crew is really just to bring as many talents together and like just control the content. It's really important that you control your content and you control your business very, very well. That's like really important for other artists out there. Um, I also love Pharrell. Like I love what he's, I love his production abilities. Like he's so sick with it. Everything he does he's just good. He's really, really good. Um, and then Jay-Z, Jay-Z, because I mean, I mean, I know it's all like top businessmen rappers, but like, I love the way that they've been able to switch it around Beyonce too, like the way that they've been able to build businesses and do all that. And then also kind of quietly like support their communities and all that. I love, I love all of that. That's like, that's the shit that I would love to do and get to that point where, you know, it becomes something. So yeah, they, I admire them a lot. They're 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 on my hero list. Good list, yeah. God. They're they're on top for a reason, and and you're doing it too in, in Cambodia. Shoot, come on now. I read I read your evolution. <laughs> yeah, it's a little, I'm, it's a quietly, smaller, like, <laughs> very much small, a smaller scale, but like. Mm-hmm. I do think impact is, is, is equally as important and, and, mm. and that like, you know, my people, we were like, we're a smaller market, but we're still important. That's what I, I think is, is important to say. We're, so, we're working there, yeah. you know, you know, baby steps. We're going to get there soon. Yeah. Yeah. So Laura, what is the best advice you've been given? Yeah. Okay. So, so um, it was, it was advice given to me as an artist and I thought it was really, really poignant. It really shocked me. So when I first got here, I came here with my guitar and I was doing like kind of sweet music. I did, I did have the rock band in the beginning, the like me's, and that was a lot of fun. And but when we came, when I, when I came solo, I was doing like guitar, like acoustic music or whatever. And then someone came to me, a friend of mine still to this day, he, he basically said to me, he's like, uh, don't be the girl next door. I know you're sweet and it's like really nice and all that kind of stuff, but don't be sweet. And I was like, what? That's like crazy. Why would you say that to me? And then he was like, be the Laura mom that, that, that no one has ever seen. Be that, be, be beyond yourself, transcend yourself. Don't, don't be what everyone expects you to be. Be what everyone expects you not to be and be fearless. And I was like, damn, that's some, that's some cold, some cold <laughs> shit. You know, I was like, I, you know, and at the time I was, I was completely like into the acoustic thing and all that kind of stuff. And, and then it was, it was good advice because it told it, it basically was like go outside of the box be outside of the box don't think within the box be outside the box what else can you bring what has something no what what happened like what what's something we all haven't seen yet you know and then so we went big onto the Khmer I went big into the like big Khmer beats after that and like the Khmer presentation Khmer dancers on stage Khmer dancers in the music and all that that all came from one piece of advice of like stop being what everyone wants you to be like sweet and likable. You don't need to be that. Like be what they don't expect that be that. And I was like, damn, that's cold. That's cold. So I thought it was really, um, really good advice. Really, really good advice. Um, and then I have to say like, this is not advice that I've been given, but this is advice I'd like to give to any artists out there. Um, read the damn contract. Plain and simple. That's it. Just read it. Read it. Get to know it. Important. Learn it. Know the language because it's important. If you ever, if you are getting into this, if you're getting into this world, like just learn to read a contract. It's important. <laughs> so read your contracts yeah. and um, financial literacy for sure. For sure. Yeah, for sure. And like save some money. Oh my God. Jeez. 
Don't spend it all. So, yeah. Don't buy that, like, like you know, gone. iced out chain, you know what I mean? <laughs> You'll get, go spend your first <laughs> rapper <laughs> check on a chain, you know? We're not going to do what they do in America. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, know, you can spend a little bit on the extra extra but like mm. you know be prepared for that rainy for that covid pandemic yeah you never know what's gonna happen. save it for a rainy day for sure it's laura if you could change anything about the music industry in cambodia and globally what would it be uh with cambodia uh, if i could change one thing um i definitely would want to see um well it would have to start with an association like in the united states we have like ASCAP and stuff like that. Uh, it's like an association for songwriters and publishing. So publishing is basically like if your song is made here, then you need to get it. It's like someone's going to collect that money for you. If it's playing in an elevator or if it's playing in a TV commercial, every time that TV commercial plays, it's going to collect that money and send it to you. So I'd like to see that kind of infrastructure start to be invested into. And I'd like to see the Cambodian government work more closely. They work with, they, I think they've been pretty supportive of original music so far, which has been really amazing. Um, but I think that they can work closer. If you look at some of the other Asian industries that are doing very, very well in music, the government and the entertainment industry works really closely together to, to pair up, like to use music as a di diplomatic tool. It's a great diplomatic tool, actually. So I'd like to see the, um, you know, more investment into that infrastructure. And, you know, everything comes with time in Cambodia, everything you have to, you have to be patient with it. Um, but I'd like to see some some of that happen here. And, and it will also, it's not just the government's role to do that. It's actually the private sector. The private sector has to come together and be like, okay, we need to do royalties. Because once you do once you have royalties, you can pay songwriters, you can pay every single person that came to be. And when you can pay everyone fairly in a way that's not a hassle and not a flat fee, then um, yeah, then you have like real deal collaboration. And that's when collaboration becomes really easy. And that's when you start to get really good products. So it's kind of like a, it's like the boring answer, but it's it's really what this industry needs. So, um, and I think we'll get there. So, but on the global scale, I think what's uh, more important to say um, is I would like to see, you know, the streaming services pay a little bit more fairly to the, to artists. And like, and I'll, I'll kind of explain a little bit something that I've recently learned as well um, that, you know, what you're getting paid in the United States is different to what you're getting paid in Cambodia, right? Per stream. Mm. And the reality is that, you know, like larger groups, like big artists like Taylor Swift and all those big, big artists, when they're selling their music in, in unknown markets like Southeast Asia, they'll take lower rates because they're basically streaming is saying like, okay, if you take lower rates, it'll encourage more people. It'll be easier for us to make our business work out here and, you know, more people will listen to your music because it's cheaper and all that kind of stuff. So they take lower rates, but that lowers the rate for all Southeast Asian artists. So if, for example, to make it easier, if Taylor Swift says, I'll take 0. 0.00004 on my streaming in um, in America, then I'll take 0. 0.00, I'm sorry, it'll be like 0. 0.001. Those are not the right numbers, but that's basically what it will look like for streaming in, in Southeast Asia. But that means that all Southeast Asian artists, no matter who you are, you will have a lower pay no matter what. So like, I think that that is a bit unfair, to be honest. It's not something that's been really looked at yet because Southeast Asia is kind of like an unknown market to those big tech companies. But I'd like them to realize that actually like people like Taylor Swift and Ariana Grande, they have the ability to sell to the international market so they can afford to take a lower rate but then Southeast Asian artists can't actually afford to take a lower rate. Hmm. So it's, it's, I think streaming rights is a really difficult subject in the music industry in general. Hmm. But um, I think as long as people know about it a little more that like, you know, we need the ability to actually make money fairly and you are actually streaming in this region and you should be prioritizing the artists in the region rather than prioritizing artists that make big money elsewhere. Um, I think that would be nice if they paid attention. But I think there's a lot of issues with streaming that are going to take some time. doesn't mean that they shouldn't be addressed, but it is something that is, is kind of hampering, um, I think, Southeast Asian artists and especially Cambodian artists. Mm. So, And, that, and, and the, the last thing I say about that is I'd love to see more viewers from America, from Canada, from uh, USA, from Korea, because, for example, when you view on YouTube, you actually get paid more um, in other countries 
and you don't get paid very much in Cambodia. So yeah, so for the fans out there that are like that are out there listening, like in the United States and, and other places, keep listening and please do encourage like more, like send it out to your, the people that you know, like when you like the songs, um, because those, you know, streaming can make money for people. And that's important that artists can actually sell their music again after the age of Napster and losing all our mm-hmm. ability to sell CDs and stuff like that. So yeah, you know, it's a really powerful thing to be a listener. Like I think the listeners have to know they're, that they're, they're very powerful and like you listening, just listening for free on Spotify gets your artist paid. So listen to right. more Cambodian music, that they get paid um, and, and, and share it and share it, especially if you live in a country with a first rate streaming, you know, package. So like shout out to, Cambodians in France, Australia, USA, and Canada. Those are definitely the highest rates. So we hope you guys are listening to the music and, and continue to share it and yeah, do that. So yeah, that's yeah, what I like to see. Are. I'm going to promote the hell out of you guys, you know? And, um, you know, even my homies, though, they know who, who you guys are. They always mention Vanda, like, you know? So you guys are mm-hmm. starting to build that name here in America. And we as Khmer Americans, we, we love to see what's coming out of Cambodia. And we're here for yeah. it, and we support it, and um, we just got to get everybody on board. Everybody be like, he's he's gonna be a household yeah. name in America, come on, America. I feel soon. Yeah, also, sure. also, I big news in Spotify, right? It's now available in yeah. Cambodia, which is a game changer. Before yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't allowed. No, yeah, you couldn't mm-hmm. even you couldn't even like get, log in. You'd have to log in with a VPN. So like. Mm-hmm. It's great. It's actually really, really great. And Apple Music is here. And like, those are the ones that truly like, wow, they, they, they have much better rates. And, you know, if we, I do believe that Cambodians, when, when we start to like build our streaming prowess on the actual, on these actual platforms, that's when you get your like Cambodian artists on the ground will get access to playlists and all these different things that, that help to promote other artists around the world. Right. They all have the infrastructure for it. And like, this moment right now where we're at is like, let's build that streaming community and like continue to show love. Like it's a very powerful thing to be an audience member and just show love where you love it. Literally just listen to the music you want to listen mm. to and use it, do it in a semi-legal way, like not semi-legal, legal way, which is mm. Spotify, Apple, YouTube, all that. Like those are, those are all paying uh, platforms. So right. yeah. You know, like I know it's, it's like it's usually a thing to as Cambodians to like get an MP3, like to get like a USB that has all of my music on an, on an MP3. Like that's really popular out here. Mm. It's like if you can just stream it because actually you're not paying too much for it. And right. and then that's getting money into the artist's pockets so that they can make more music and actually thrive. Because being a musician is being a business person. You have to invest in a lot of equipment and, and knowledge and all that kind of stuff. So you're literally in helping that artist invest. So, yeah. I agree 100%. Like, to the listeners and the viewers out there that always wonder how you guys could support us as artists, streaming. Yeah. We don't ask for money. Streaming is, like, the best way you can support. Like, even a YouTube view is a stream, so it's, like, it's very powerful. Yeah. I'm not over here trying to, like, shove my, my merch down your throat, my, my T-shirt. I have it, but I just yeah. don't promote it. I'd rather have you guys listen to the music or the... In the content and enjoy it and that's like the best way because streams they, they add up and it's like a generational income I'm, I'm thinking for my kids i want this for my kids for the long run for when i die my music gonna take care of my my seed you know yeah definitely i mean that's that's where we're headed I and mean, that's where we are going and um to the would-be artists out there like think of your music as like treated treated with respect like it's it's treasure these are like these are these are like you know time stamps in, in history so um, you know, people are going to look back at this time and look at the lyrics, look at what people were saying, look at what hurt, look at what people, what made them feel good. And like, even we do, like, I, I, I don't know if you go hardcore on throwback, but I do like, I'll go back to old songs that make me feel young, just make me feel like summertime in the LBC makes me feel like I'm young and I'm pimping, you know? So like, that's, we ain't that's saying nothing but a word. Throwback's all I listen to, like 90s R&B is like, I still bump it or like religiously, even like freestyle, <laughs> like I like the Stevie B, I, I have his own. He's my only decoration. And like, I listen to like freestyle new wave music. It's like stuff I grew up on. And like, I feel like it was yeah. like the golden era and just like good, happy music with the meaning and things were more simpler. It's just like, to me, I'm, I'm going to say like the 90s will always be the best era. You know, the time of the Michael Jackson, the I Remember the Times, the, the SWVs, the, you know, the list goes on, the TLCs, you know, 
the Whitney Houston's, the Mariah Carey's. You know, I, I love all that. I could listen to that over and over, and it feels like the first time hearing it. You know, I'm like, Montel yeah. Jordan, this is how yeah. we do it. You know, feel good music. Oh and I'm, I'm oh starting to hear kind of feel good in your guys' music. So it's like music always evolves. It's always like, you know, you always take from old. You know, that's what music is. It's a constant recycling and then it just um evolving, yeah. you know, making it newer and just, yeah, just you know. Exactly. It's evolving. It's, it's, it's a living, breathing thing. It breathes. It lives. It's like. It's cool. And like, I love that it, like, you know, it stays in your heart like that. Like, when I hear this, is how I do it, this is how we do it. Like, I want to go to America right away and like party hella hard. So, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, to the viewers out there, realize you guys are in power. You guys actually have all the fuck, all the power, not just the fucking power, but like the power. You do have the power to shape the industry. The, literally, the viewers have all the power to shape the industry. So it's cool. It's like, we're at your mercy and we hope you like what we do, but please just show love. That's all you have to do, just listen. And if you like it, great. If you don't like it, no worries. You know, it's all good. Great answer. Like, wow, this is, it's an amazing interview and I can't wait to share it. And um, I think uh, we covered a lot and um, I just want to ask you what's next. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm obviously like, I'm definitely, I mean, I will visit the United States soon just for fun, but I'm, I'm really committed to Maramai and the artists here and the mission that we have here, which is simply to grow the, grow the arts industry and like, not just music, hopefully film in the future. And, and also like people like yourself, like the young influencers, vloggers, podcasters, everything. Like, um, I'd love to see, the culture just grow and become so full. I think, you know, there's a lot of energy still on the ground in Cambodia because it's mostly youth. It's like all under 35, pretty much. It's like a young, young, young country out here. And what's next for us is we're going to be very serious about building the Barame platform into a respectable, I would like to build into a respectable platform that can actually do business with other music labels internationally. And I'd like to see Cambodian artists under our label collaborate internationally and in a respectable way where there's dignity on both sides and, and like, you know, just pure talent oozing out of that, whatever projects that we do. And the other thing that's really important to me and I thought was, you know, I wanted to bring up on your podcast in particular is I do really want to start building the bridge for Cambodians across in any kind of um, environment, you know, like I know that there's talent in America. I know that you're in America. I know that there's talent in Australia, in Canada and, and uh, all over the world, to be honest, there's Cambodians all over. And I think one of the big issues that I, I also come across for some artists that are out there or people that are out there is that they feel disconnected from Cambodia completely. And to be honest, Cambodia feels disconnected to all of those communities as well. And what I'd like to see happen is we really start to connect. So, um, and I think music is a very powerful medium for that. Um, any kind of, any kind of medium is, 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 any kind of art medium is, is, is powerful for connecting and bringing our people back together. Because to be totally frank, I think that Cambodian people have had like a really tough time in history and, but that only makes us grittier and we can like use that toughness to like do some amazing stuff and be like, you know, the superheroes. So I would really like to start connecting with artists abroad. I'd like to see your stuff. I'd like to see your music. I'd like to see whatever you have, send it to us. We are building, quietly building some platforms that I think that um, you guys are going to really enjoy in the future. And um, yeah, basically we want to put Cambodia on the map. Like we're on the map. I'm just going to like, put the big like loudspeakers like you know those big loudspeakers you see in Cambodia all the time yep. that are like playing music all the time I want to like build a giant speaker out of Cambodia and we're gonna like make the world hear us rather than wait around for them to hear us. yeah that's what's next love it I'm here for it and I support it and I agree we gotta build that yeah. bridge just connect you know it's time to just collaborate and just work together unity baby yeah. unity, we're stronger, baby. We're stronger yeah. together we, we literally are. We really, really are. And I think it's very possible. And we got to do it from the ground up, not from, there's not going to be no magic that comes from the top down for this movement. It's going to be from the ground up. 
people like yourself and all the artists out there and all the listeners out there. Like all of you are part of it. There's, there's like, it's just one ecosystem. So we need each other. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Laura. I, w- I want to ask you, um, you know, before we uh, end this on a good note, what advice would you want to give to the next generation? That's a really good question. And I think that it's, it's a really complex one because I think that the next generation is growing up in a world that is particularly, I think, okay, well, well, to be honest, we have a lot more racism, which we're dealing with the United States and across like, in, in Western countries. Um, and it's a time where even in Cambodia, you know, commerce language and education is what's being taught is English. And we're, we're forgetting a bit of our roots a little bit sometimes. Um, and I would give advice to the next generation, like no matter what, you're going to grow up wherever you are, whether you're growing up in Cambodia, you're growing up abroad or whatever, you have got to stay connected to your culture and it's going to help you in the future. It's going to help you stay grounded and it's going to give you a beautiful, there is a, it's a, it's a beautiful way to live life with meaning because Cambodia's story you know, there are lots of different stories that can be told. There's lots of different narratives that can be told about the Cambodian story. And I think that if you understand where you come from, you understand where you are. And if you understand where you are, it will be much simpler to get to where you're going. So like, I really want people to connect. I really think that uh, culture is not just, entertainment is not just entertainment, something that's like there for your pleasure. It's actually a really beautiful human way for us to bond, stay connected and to do great things together. And I think that if people, you know, if people understand that and if the young people out there understand where we're coming from and like understand the the positive notes about where we're going. Yeah, you're going to be you also are going to have like a really, really amazing life. And and I think that um yeah, you got to stay up. You got to stay positive. Read the damn contract. No matter what you do, <laughs> read the damn contract. Um, and that's just for all peoples out there. Um, but yeah, I, I think that stay connected. I think it's important to be open-minded and be willing to engage that energy that is being Cambodian. So it is a, it's a complex one. It's one that's full of heartbreak and um, pain too. But it's also a really, really beautiful, beautiful state of being. So, yeah, if you can connect to that and use that energy to power through your life, it's going to be great. So, yeah. Love it. Kind of, yeah, yeah. So hopefully that helps somebody out there. Oh, definitely. I'm sure it will. And um, like my mom always said, complete beside my complete babini client. You know, just... Yeah. Don't forget your, you know, your culture. And um, it's important to uh, know your identity and stuff. So, like, I always take yeah. it to heart. Like, you know, it, it all makes sense now. So, Yeah, stay curious. Be curious. Like, you'll find there's le- lots of lessons in the culture for you. You'll, you'll find. I, I found it in my life. So, yeah. Right. Any shout outs you want to give? Uh, I want to give a shout out to Ray right now. I'm just kidding. Um, I want to shout out to, yeah, I want to shout out to all the bottom eight team and, and my artists and stuff. They all have done a really, really amazing job surviving COVID and still kicking butt in music. Um, I'll give a shout out to you for having me on this show. Thank you. This has been a real pleasure to talk to you. And then a shout out, especially to all the my folks, just everybody out there that is, is anyone who's having a hard time, like during this period of time that we're going through, um, you know, keep your head up in the words of Tupac, keep your head up. It's going to be okay. Just hold on. We're going to be all right. So, yeah. Laura, I just want to thank you so much for blessing me with your time, sharing your story, dropping some knowledge. And I just want to say you're, you're truly an icon, a great role model to our youth. And um, keep killing it in Sir Kamai and keep uh, raising the gold standard. So I respect yeah, you so you. much. I'm a fan and you got my support. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll be in touch with you. You know that. So for sure. Keep doing what you do. I love it. Appreciate it. I will. I'll keep doing it. What up, everybody? This is Laura Mom. And I just wanted to say you are tuned in to Chloe Talk and it's been 
real, y'all. See ya. Thank you, Laura. Yeah.